Uh, my name is Robin Moffat. I work at Confluent, one of the companies behind the open source Apache Kafka project. And um, I wish I was in Berlin today. It's uh, glorious sunshine in Yorkshire, but I'm sure it's the uh, glorious skies like this in Berlin too. Um, but we're stuck at home at the moment. But today I'd like to talk about getting data from a database into Kafka. And I'm going to talk about why we want to do that. I'm going to talk about how we go about doing that, because like, it's important to understand both sides of this. So let's start off by thinking about like why would you even want to get data from your database into Kafka? Because like perhaps that data is quite happy in the database. Perhaps it doesn't want to be in Kafka. But it turns out that getting data from your databases into Kafka powers a bunch of really useful things that we can do with it. So sometimes people want to say, well, I've got data sat in my database, and I want to build analytics against it. I'm querying that database directly, perhaps it's kind of like overhead and performance, all those kind of things, why we don't want to do it on the database. So you say, well, let's offload it from that database, and we'll put it somewhere else. And nowadays, that's probably going to be a cloud data warehouse or a cloud object store or somewhere like that. But we can use Kafka as the piece in the middle to kind of like get that data and buffer it and store it and push it out to the places where we want to use it. So that's one very common use case. Data sat in our database, we want it somewhere else. Kafka acts as the perfect broker and medium and platform for doing that data transfer, like getting the data out and pushing the data somewhere else in a reliable and scalable way. Another thing we want to do with the data is not just go and shove it somewhere else, but actually use that data in our stream processing to enrich other data that we've got flowing through our streams. So perhaps we've got a microservice somewhere that's writing information about orders that have been taken in a service or whatever, and that's writing onto a Kafka topic. And we want to enrich that information that we've got about the orders being placed with things like, well, who is the customer who placed that order? We probably know it was customer ID 42, but what's their email address or their shipping address or their loyalty club status or all that kind of stuff that we tend to keep on databases. So by pulling in data from a database, we can stream it into Kafka and use stream processing to join it to events as they arrive from other places. And we can use that to drive applications. We can use it to drive like real-time dashboards and things like that about the orders that are being placed. The other thing we can do with getting data from a database into Kafka is to actually start to evolve our existing systems towards a new way of building them. So many, many um, systems nowadays are built as monoliths. Right? Nothing wrong with monoliths, but sometimes people decide that's not actually the way they want to continue with it. But instead of going to just like ditch all of that and start afresh, we can say, well, we've got our existing monolith, our existing application here in the top left. And we say, well, all, almost certainly it's going to have a database underpinning it. Something happens in that monolith, it gets written to the database. Well, we can capture the events out of that database into Kafka. And so like, as stuff happens in the database, like record at a time, those are events which we can capture into Kafka. We can use that to drive new services and applications that we're building. So that way we can start to chip away at bits of functionality that have got in our existing system and replace it with new bits of functionality, but driven by the same events from the same database. Now, get the idea of getting data out of a database into an event streaming platform like Kafka may sound a little bit kind of like, is this like squares and circles? Like, do these things actually match up? Because Kafka is about data in motion and streams and events, and databases are about data at rest, like right? static lumps of data. But there's actually a very, very tight relationship between the two. And let's have a little look at that. If you think about a database table that holds account balances, we say for account ID, what is the current balance? Account ID, one, two, three, four, five. The current balance is 50 euros. How did that balance get there? Well, we deposited some money into that bank account. So we deposited 50 euros. So we credited it to there, and now the balance is 50 euros. And then we deposited some more money. So we deposited another 25 euros. Now the balance has changed. If I query the database table and say, what is the current balance? It says, the current balance is 75 euros. And then I spend some money, and the balance changes again. So what we have here is the idea of a stream of events. And you can replay that stream to build the table. At any point in that stream, you have the actual state that those events uh, roll up to. And the table is our state. So you can go from a stream to a table, 
but you can also go from a table to a stream. Every change to that table is an event. And if you capture all of those events, you could replay them to build the table state. But so this is called the stream table duality. A duality because it goes both ways. So we can take tables and existing databases, capture the changes from those to give us a stream of events. From a stream of events, we can then roll through to a state, to a table, at any time we want to. So that gives rise to this great quotation from Pat Helland, the truth is the log, the database is a cache of a subset of the log. All you actually need, like the fundamental pieces that you need, are the events. With the events, you can then build a database table if you want to, but you don't have to. You can use those events on their own also. So these are some of the reasons why we want to get data from a database into Kafka and conceptually how we can even think about translating a table into a stream because they're actually intrinsically linked. But now let's think about how we're going to go and do that. All the different pieces that we've got at our disposal to actually go and do this. Well, the simple answer is Kafka Connect. And Kafka Connect is part of Apache Kafka. So if you're using Apache Kafka, you already have Kafka Connect. And it comes with source connectors that you can use to get in data from systems into Kafka, which is what we're going to talk about here. There's also sync connectors, so pushing data from Kafka down to other places. So it gives rise to this great ecosystem of connectors built around Kafka Connect. And the really nice thing about Kafka connectors, as well as kind of like someone else having invented that wheel and perfected that wheel of doing scalable, uh, resilient stream, stream integration between Kafka and other systems, is that you don't have to write any code. The people who wrote the connectors wrote the code. As users, we just write configuration. We declare we have data in this place, and we would like to put it into that place and get data from this table on this database and put it into this Kafka topic. Or if you're doing a sync, from this Kafka topic down to this other system. But we're all about the source connectors here. We're going to get data from a database into Kafka. Now, many people familiar with databases will have heard of the term CDC, change data capture. And a lot of people assume there is just one way of doing CDC. But it turns out there's two. And the purpose of this talk is to really dig into the difference between these two options and help you understand how you can choose which is the best one to use for your requirements. So as with most things in IT, it depends. There are two different ways of doing it. You'll probably find most people use one of them, but that's not to say the other one isn't useful in many different cases also. So we have query-based change data capture, and we have log-based change data capture. If you're like familiar with databases and CDC, you'll probably be thinking of log-based change data capture. But I'm going to walk through now what the two different types are and how you can choose which one to use. So query-based change data capture, it runs a query against the database. So it queries it to say, what's changed since I last queried? So it pulls the database. So it says, select everything from this particular table where there's a particular column which is going to indicate what's changed. So it could be a timestamp. It could be an ID, but something which is going to go up that we can compare against, like based on last time, has something changed? So if we have a database and it looks like this, on the left-hand side, we've got two rows of data denoted by those red rectangles there. We can pull the database and say, select everything that's changed since our little watermark there, our little last previous timestamp that we pulled the database. They said, well, there are two rows they've been created. So we get two events in our Kafka topic, two messages in our Kafka topic. Something changes in the database, we insert a new row, we pull the database a moment later. It says, well, everything that's changed since we last checked, which is now this watermark here, this offset here, it says, well, what's changed there is this particular row, and we get that onto our Kafka topic. That's conceptually what query-based change data capture is doing. It's querying the database. Well, it's, it uses JDBC. It's literally running a JDBC query against or query using JDBC against the database to work out what's changed. Log-based change data capture, on the other hand, looks a lot more scary. It's like one of those scenes from like the hacker films. I should have done it with green text on the black background and made it look proper like that. But what this is doing is using the database's transaction log. So the way that relational databases work and implementations differ, but broadly speaking, they have what's called a transaction log, which is what the database writes information to when you make a change. And that gives you your ability to recover things and roll back changes and replay changes and like recover from failures and all sorts of stuff like that. But the transaction log holds that information. So some things in the database, we've got two rows of data as before, using log-based change data capture, 
we can capture those changes into a Kafka topic. And something changes in the database, and that goes onto the transaction log, and we can capture that into our Kafka topic. So we've got two viable ways of doing the same thing. We want to capture changes to the data. So most of these ones, you're going to end up with a snapshot first, like here's everything in the table, and then we're going to capture the changes of everything that happens after that snapshot. So now we need to understand how do we actually choose which one to use, which one's going to be most appropriate for what we're trying to do. So query-based change data capture, we need to understand a little bit more about how does it actually work and what are some of the limitations around it. So query-based change data capture, you've got to have a field in your schema which is going to change when your record does. So this could be an ID field, which goes up, like an incrementing ID field. But usually, you'll have a timestamp field, which is going to get set when you insert the row and changed when you update it. So we've got like a create table statement. Here's some DDL. Different languages or different databases will use different flavors of it. But here we're saying the timestamp column is a timestamp. Surprise, surprise. And we're saying by default, it's got a current timestamp. So we insert a row and have the current timestamp on update when it gets updated. We're going to also use the current timestamp. So when we update that row, the timestamp on it will be set. So I think this is the MySQL implementation. You can use triggers or whatever to achieve similar things on other relational databases. But you have to have this field in your schema. And it'd be fairly uncommon not to have something like that anyway, just because it makes life easier when we're building applications. But if you don't, you can't use query-based changes data capture. All you can do is like capture the whole table each time which might be useful once, but kind of like snapshotting the entire table every however many seconds doesn't always make a great deal of sense. So we have to have the ability to have that in the schema already or make those modifications to the schema, which if it's your own application may be fair enough. If it's a third party one or a different team in the organization, sometimes that can be a sticking point. So we have an insert. It gets made into the database. We can query the database, say what's changed since we last checked, and we capture that insert. We've got other DML operations. We make an update. So that existing row that we captured into our Kafka topic, it gets updated. And our timestamp column in the database, whether a trigger or our application, it updates that timestamp column. So when we pull the database again and say where the timestamp column value is greater than when we last checked, and the polling interval you can customize, but whatever the interval is set to, has the timestamp column got a greater value than when we last checked? Or if we're using ID columns, has the ID column value gone up since the one that we checked before, and we can capture the updates into our Kafka topic like that. If we delete a message, we see, OK, we do a delete from the table, and then we query the database and say, tell me about the rows in the table that have changed since we last pulled the table. It says, well, OK, well, that row is deleted. Obviously, we don't know about it because it's not in the table anymore. You can't query a table for data that doesn't exist. Now. They kind of like smart Alex amongst you will probably be saying, ah, well, in this particular relational database, you can use triggers or uh, flashback or all these sorts of different things. And conceptually, you could. But fundamentally, query-based change data capture cannot, unless you go and customize it or whatever, capture deletes. You can go and fork it and write your own. But out of the box, query-based change data capture cannot capture deletes because you cannot query a database for data which doesn't exist. So that's one of the wrinkles with query-based change data capture. The other one is a little bit more subtle, but it's potentially the most crucial point in deciding which method are we going to use. So let's imagine we're capturing information about orders. So we've got an order table, and our application writes orders, and we're going to replicate that table into a Kafka topic so that we can go and feed an analytics system. So here we pull the database, and we say, well, the previous timestamp was at 53 minutes past the hour and 30 seconds. It's a 30 second poll. So at 54 minutes past the hour, uh, so, yeah, 54 minutes past the hour, zero seconds, we run the query, we don't get anything, which is fair enough. No orders have been placed in that 30 second interval. 30 seconds later, we pull it again. So this is 54 seconds, 54 minutes, and 30 seconds past the hour, and we capture a new row. So it says, okay, order I42 is being shipped to this address. This is the timestamp at which it was updated. So 10:54 in 29 seconds. So one second before we polled, this record was there. That's fine. We've captured the current state of the table, and we're doing so every 30 seconds. And if we're capturing that into an analytics system, like I say, that may be sufficient. If all that analytics system wants to know about the state of orders, like tell me about all of the orders that we've shipped and whatever, that's 
that's totally fine. But if we're starting to build applications around the concept of events, or if we're doing analytics based on the progress of an order through the system, we want to know about everything that happened to that order, not just its current state when we check the table. So if you think about it, the order probably got created. So maybe it was one second after we last polled. So at 54 minutes past the hour and one second, so just after we polled, someone placed the order, or like they clicked on a button which sent it into a pending status. So the order gets created, it's an insert into the table. There's no address at this point. So then a few seconds later, the users obviously created their customer profile and they put an address into it. So the record gets updated. And then a couple of seconds after that, user realizes, oh, well, that's the delivery address I wanted, like my home address. So they update the address on the order again. And then it gets shipped. Okay, so it's like super quick processing. It's been created. We've set the address a couple of times and then we've shipped it all within the space of 28 seconds. So when we first checked the table, there was no data. 30 seconds later, we check the table, we capture the state. But in between, it turns out a whole bunch of stuff has happened. So query-based change data capture is easier to run because we're just querying the database. All you need are the credentials for the table, or select credentials against that table, connection details for the database, and off we go. We can capture the state of the table at the point at which we pull it. But what we cannot capture or guarantee to capture is every single event. So what's actually happened during that polling interval is four different events. We created an order, we changed the address, we changed the address again, and then we shipped the order. Those four different events, which depending on the system we're building, like four completely different things, maybe four different microservices want to know about that. There's the fraud checking one, which needs to know when the address gets changed, and the fulfillment one needs to know when it's being shipped. These are events, and events matter, because events model the world around us. So capturing the individual events oftentimes is super important. So this is where it comes down to like, are we gonna use query-based or log-based change data capture? If we're quite happy, simply taking a snapshot of the table, the state of the table at that point in time that we polled it, that's fine. But if we need the events, then we kind of have to use log-based change data capture. So query-based change data capture, it's much easier to set up. It needs fewer permissions because we're simply querying the database. It's not much different from logging into SQL Plus and running a query against the database, but we're just doing it repeatedly. And we are doing it repeatedly. So we're actually putting a load on the database because we're going to be polling the database frequently. Or we pull it less frequently because we get a phone call from our friendly DBA who says, like, what's this query that's running every second against the database on a column which I forgot to index? It's like, oh, well, yeah, we just like, want to do change data capture against it. Like, well, no, you're not going to do that against my database. So he's like, okay, we'll dial it down. We'll just like pull the database every minute or every 10 minutes, which again comes down to requirements. If you don't need the data other than every 10 minute snapshot, that's probably fine. If you want to do actual event driven processing, when an event happens, respond to it, 10 minutes isn't going to really cut the mustard. You need something which is much more instantaneous. We need to have access to the schema to change the schema or make there are certain demands on the schema in terms of having a field there, like an incrementing ID column and or a timestamp column, which we can use to check against for has the row changed. And we can't track deletes. So tracking deletes, are like something being deleted is also an event. It's like the absence of data is also something we want to know about. So query-based change data capture is fine. Log-based change data capture is kind of like, it's just like a more refined way of dealing with the data. So log-based change data capture, we have the snapshot of what's in the table currently, that mirrors over into our Kafka topic. We make an update. An update goes into the transaction log. So that transaction log has information about what row has been updated. Usually it captures what was the state of the row before the update and after. So not only are we capturing like, here's what the table currently looks like, but we're capturing the fact that something got changed, here's what got changed to, here's what it was before. So the customer changed their address and their address is now this, and they've changed it from that. So that you actually get really rich invent events through from the transaction log. We capture those into our Kafka topic, and we can also capture deletes because the delete is an event in the database. It meets a DML uh, statement. It gets written to the transaction log. So the database needs to capture that into its transaction log because the transaction log is what it replays against the kind of the, the backup snapshot files. We need to rule for the state of the database. So we have the delete 
in the transaction log, we can capture that into our Kafka topic also. If you take a look at that picture there, on the bottom left, we've got the transaction log with our, kind of our inserts and our updates and our deletes. On the right hand side, we've got our inserts and our updates and our deletes. So what's kind of interesting for me in this is that on the right hand side, we've got Apache Kafka with this idea of like an immutable app end only log of events. On the left hand side, we've got the concept of a relational database from like decades ago of an immutable series of events. You can't go into a relational database and kind of like hack around on the transaction log, or if you can, you're a braver person than I. The database's transaction log is this immutable series of events. Apache Kafka is an immutable series of events. It's just that it's distributed and highly scalable. And so this gives you this interesting idea that like, could Kafka be the fundamental basis for like the concept of a database? And there's like, I know this kind of, it's kind of a clickbaity idea. Like there's articles written around it, is Kafka a database and so on. But conceptually, we're doing the same thing. We're capturing events in our data and then building stuff on top of it. It's just that we're a relational database. We kind of like ship the whole package and like with a nice SQL layer on top as the API for people to interact with it. Whereas Kafka kind of gives you the framework and the platform, but things like key SQL DB are being built around that to give you a SQL interface to those events. Anyway, I'll kind of like digress. I'm going off on a bit of a tangent. So log-based change data capture, it gives us this fidelity of the data. It captures every single event that happens in the database. So we can actually guarantee we've got a snapshot of the table. We've quiesced it at a certain point of the snapshot. And then we've captured every single change that's happened to that data since that snapshot. So we've got a full replica of what's happening to our data in the source system in our Kafka topic. So we can use that to drive our event-driven applications. So there's that great talk from Gunnar and Hans Peter beforehand about patterns which uh, change data capture. And that's the idea of building applications around this data that you can get out of a database. It's much lower latency and lower impact on the source system because it's a lower level API. But because it's a lower level API, you need much greater access to the system. You need to make friends with your DBA, who you should be friends with anyway, because they're lovely people and you need to get the appropriate permissions to install it and uh, access to the database because it is a low level API that you're working with. So that gives us an idea of what query-based change data capture is, what log-based change data capture is, and how you decide which one to use. If you're building event-driven applications, you're gonna almost certainly wanna be using log-based change data capture. If you just want to capture the state of a table, and you're maybe taking like first baby steps with Kafka and databases and like, what's the easiest, like lowest friction way of setting this kind of stuff up? Then query-based change data capture gives you a nice easy route into it. And it may well get you plenty of the way along of like of a proof of concept of like what we can get out, what can we do with this data? What can we build with it once it's in Kafka? So having made that decision, which one you're going to use, let's actually look at some of the tools that are available. So query-based change data capture is provided by the JDBC connector. So you can go to Confluent Hub and you can see all of these different connectors for Kafka Connect. Uh, so the JDBC connector gives you a source connector. There's also a sync for pushing data from Kafka into a database, but that's an entirely different talk. So uh, JDBC connector lets you do uh, query-based change data capture against your source database. For log-based change data capture, there's the Oracle connector, CDC connector uh, from Confluence. And for all the other databases and Oracle also, there's the Debezium project, which provides some excellent, excellent connectors. Gunnar and Hans Peter both work on uh, with Debezium. A lot of Gunnar's the project lead on it. And this gives you really, really good connectors for getting data out of MySQL and Postgres and a bunch of other ones as well. So those are some really useful tools. There are tons of other uh, connectors and like third-party applications for doing getting data out of databases into Kafka, but those are like the three there which I kind of like particularly choose to highlight. Hopefully that's been useful. I think I've got a few minutes left for Q and A, so I'll, I'll turn to that in just a moment. But a couple of resources for you. Um, Confluent Developer is where you can go and learn all about Apache Kafka. There's tutorials, there's blogs, there's podcasts, there's videos. There's all sorts of useful stuff there. And then you can find me online and on Twitter. I'm at Armoff. There's my handle there in the bottom left. You can find the slides for this and a bunch of other talks and recordings that I do at uh, armoff.dev slash talks. And you can also find me on YouTube. So like lockdown has been with us for a while now, but last year when I kind of got taken off the road and couldn't go to conferences in person, I started doing a YouTube channel. 
So there's a bunch of talks on there. There's a lot of stuff about Kafka Connect. So if the idea of Kafka Connect is something that you like or you use it already, go and check out that channel. Make sure you subscribe. Let's get the uh, subscriber number going up and to the right. Um, but there's a ton of useful content there also. So with that, thank you very much for your time. And I'll be delighted to take any questions that we have. Thanks, Robin. Uh, that was a really, uh, really an awesome talk. Um, um, I, I, I like the uh, distinguishing between query-based and uh, log-based uh, CDC. Um, never thought about it that way. So we have um, a question from the from the audience. Uh, it's a bit longer, so I'll just read it. So, in a microservice world, local database state is very much the internal representation for a service versus the API that this microservice exposes. Uh, for example, there could be some data model changes in the database where the API doesn't change. What would be a good pattern for exposing the same API data in Kafka so business logic won't have to be replicated between services and event processing? Oh, uh, OK. I've, I've got the question up here. So just give me a second. So uh, in the microservice world, OK. Um, a good pattern for exposing the same API data in Kafka so business logic won't have to be replicated. I don't actually know, I'm afraid. <laughs> I do know who would know, and that's Gunnar and Hans Peter. Um, so that would be a great question to take to them. I know they're on Twitter also. Um, so if you are on Twitter, then tag me on Twitter, and I'll pass it on to them, um, or just reach out to them directly. Um, I would need to have a sit and a, a scratch my head about that one, which I'll, I'll do after this. But um, I don't have a, an answer straight away for that. I'm sorry. <laughs> 